Hey! Hi! How you doing? This is Ryan, and welcome back to the Gamertron Show, and today I have a very special video for you all. I am joined by my good friend and fellow content creator, Beard Grizzly. How you doing, man? Oh, I'm doing alright. How about yourself, Ryan? Ah, pretty great. We're, I'm hanging out with you, so pretty great day overall, I'd say. <laughs> well, I don't know about that one, but okay. <laughs> Do you smell that? It smells like... Self-deprecating humor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I should go do that stand-up comedy bit at some point, shouldn't I? <laughs> yes, yes, you should. <laughs> I, might, I might actually get somewhere other than some other YouTube talent I can think of that have their own shows at this point. <laughs> anyway. Oh, you're very pessimistic for someone who plays Destiny and, and tries to keep the light alive and fight for hope and the, the Guardian way or whatever. Don't you know I'm a dredgen? I I don't give a damn about any of that. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, brother. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, you've been playing a lot of Destiny 2 lately, haven't you? I didn't just get season rank 100. I don't know what you're talking about. Stop looking at me like that. No, stop judging me. Knock it off. <laughs> so I want to talk to you about uh, this game that you and I both play. Uh, so we have a few different opinions on its current state. I personally believe it's in the best state it's ever been in. We still have some stuff to complain about, which is what we're going to do in this video, as mm -hmm. you can tell by the title, everyone watching and listening. <laughs> I mean, to be completely fair here, as everybody, I think, on the internet sort of understands here, Destiny has not exactly had the most uh resounding history i guess you could say uh it's been of course full of problems its development has definitely not been the smoothest it could be uh and there are things that are absolutely warranted in talking about when it comes down to those criticisms and how we can handle them uh it's not to say that we hate the game it's that we love it so much that we want to continue to see it do well uh, and right now, Bungie is sort of bordering, at least in my opinion, on this portion where I have to wonder how much uh, full care and attention is going into everything that they are trying to do, or if they just need some help. There's a lot of stuff that went into original development for Destiny that has definitely changed and shifted with what they had previously. So, I don't know. Th this is criticism. This isn't meant to be like a go bash down the doors of Bungie and throw them out or anything like that. This is criticism. This is to say that there are ways that you can improve and connect everything instead of making it feel so fragmented and disconnected. Ah, he said the thing. He I said did. the thing in the title. I did. It's like I know what's coming or something. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, like, and it's only because of criticism that Bungie has been able to improve the game the way well, they have, so I'm sure they don't mind having more sent their way. Well, yeah. mm, I'm sure their therapists don't mind more being sent their <laughs> way. Yeah, okay, that's, that's kind of fair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also do want to put a small disclaimer on most of this as well. Uh, obviously, of course, don't go... Uh, hate on any developer whatsoever for what they attempt to do. Unless it's uh, Activision. Uh, unless it's actually any of the top three. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, to be completely fair, though, in that respect, like every single one of them, I would figure uh, as a developer, a developer, note not the suit above them, is mm -hmm. trying their best with what they have. A developer, a coder, a story writer, anything has a vision, has a general idea of what they're going for, and these things have to, of course, always be met with the ideas of, well, this is how far we can take it realistically, uh, and this is how far you want to take it, so we have to figure somewhere in the middle as a, as a meeting ground for a lot of stuff with video games. Uh, for instance, people get really sick and tired of, like, reusing models and everything like that. I know that's a common discussion that's out there, uh, especially with Destiny and reusing weapon models and so on a lot. But there's reasons for that. It cuts down production time. It really cuts down on the ability to uh, have to create either completely different models and setups again and allows them to get to other pieces that may actually... Uh, require a lot more care and attention and detail uh we don't know everything that goes on behind the scenes with a lot of these things and live service models especially uh sort of 
have to be given a small air of caution or a, a little bit more ground to sort of work with what they want to uh, in the sense of they have to meet a deadline a little bit more than a game like CD Projekt Red creating The Witcher or something like that over the years. So I don't know that it's a different model altogether. It's it's all I really want to say. So done. Just don't go after people. Don't uh, don't trudge them down. Don't think that this is an attack at all. None of that. Uh, if you expect that that's what this video is about, uh, what's wrong with you? You you sourpuss. Get get some perspective anyway. So. Here's the thing, Destiny 2, fun game, like a very good value as a free-to-play game since it went free-to-play, yeah. but oh boy, oh boy, like again, I greatly enjoy the game, but I would I would be dishonest if I didn't say there were some, okay, not some, a lot, of very niggling irritations, and mm. one of them being, title of this video, how the game is so fragmented, mm -hmm. and what we mean by that is... The game, like, has several separate moving pieces, several different game modes, activities, d multiple progression systems mm -hmm. that don't tie into one another. No. It's, it, the, Destiny 2 feels like several different games in this one game all fighting for your attention, and that unfortunately eats away at one another. And mm -hmm. <laughs> as you, as, some, as a veteran player like yourself who's been playing Destiny for so long, you know exactly where I'm coming from when I say that. Yep. I mean, largely, here's here's something from the veteran in me that looks back on, like, how bounties used to be handled. Uh, for one, Destiny 2 adds on a lot of extra bounties than what we had previously. So that's one thing. Uh, we had the, the planetary bounties that kind of exist now at this point. Uh, we have the stuff in the tower for Zavala, for Shax, for Drifter. Uh, you've got Ada One's bounties. You've got the seasonal bounties that are out there, too, when Eva's in the tower. Uh, there used to be the bounties that you could get from Tess Everest as well, if we want to bring those up. Uh, you now have the bounties from uh, for this season, the Obelisk, and also Saint-14. So there are several different places that you can acquire bounties, and I don't even think I've hit all of them at this point. Uh, previously, with Destiny 1, it used to be that you would have some stuff that you could acquire weekly, like you do now, but very few instances of that. Uh, you would also have uh, ones that you would get from Shax, you would get them from uh, Zavala or your Vanguard Master eventually. Uh, and there was always this one unified bounty guy that was there, Xander9940. Xander was the bounty master. The whole point of him in the tower was to talk to him and acquire bounties that would go over the entirety of Destiny. Now, there were, again, very few of them that existed, but there at least was the unified perspective on how ba uh, bounties were handled. There were even some that some of the ones you could get for strikes and everything. You could still do them outside of strikes. Some of the stuff that you could do with Crucible, you could still do them outside of Crucible. There's a little bit of that holdover with the bounties that we have currently, but none of those systems like to collide. Uh, save for one, which you and I talked about a little bit here beforehand. Drifter. Mm -hmm. Drifter has this setup that makes complete sense. You go and talk with Drifter, and he's got the two sets of bounties that are there for the two game modes for Gambit, Gambit and Gambit Prime. You then have the ones that are there for Reckoning underneath that. But underneath those are the civil bounties. The civil bounties actually tie out to everything else outside of the system. In a way, it's Drifter's means for how Gambit is supposed to run as a game mode. Uh, he's teaching you how the dark works and everything like that, but he's also trying to to give you incentive to still help others in the system outside of just himself. And that actually is a very big lore implication that I won't really get into, even though that's what I care about most, I think, when all said and done with this game anymore. But the general perspective for gameplay, you go out and you do other things from different areas and different zones than, what ju than just Gambit. So for me, that was a, a very good move for them to do, uh, and it made a lot of sense. The same is also said, though, of Ada-1 and the Banshee Bounties. Aye. Uh, both of these actually allow you to do a lot of stuff outside of their respective activities, which, granted, Banshee doesn't have an activity other than 
Here's a gun. Go shoot. Well, it. he does like, have a, he generally. does have an activity. Am- amnesia. That's ironic that you bring that up, considering the next episode I'm writing. But anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's he he's the the cohesive glue between all of the the bounty sets that you receive and i just find that hilarious uh his whole point is to just basically give you more exp throughout the entirety of the season for season pass and everything like that but it's just hilarious to me that he is the only one anymore that has uh some kind of cohesive glue that actually matters to the season which goes into another thing that I think we'll get to here a little later on. But yeah, I, I've yammered on about this enough. I, I will get into seasons very shortly, but to go back to game modes, like mm. you said, outside of Drif- Drifter and Ada, where Ada, you like you do activities killing things with certain weapons so you can get new Black Armory weapons, and with uh, and with Drifter, you're constantly earning those... Uh, oh, I can't, I can't believe I forgot the name. But you know, the, the, the friggin' tokens. The friggin' tokens you put into your... Oh, uh, to your moat generator. You know what I mean. Yeah. So, I'm sorry if I forget destiny terminology, everybody. There's a lot of fucking names for shit in this game. It's ridiculous. <laughs> okay, but you all know what I mean. Point is, like, with those guy, with those uh, vendors, with those guys, you can go out and play multiple activities. You can make progress in multiple different activities. You're multi-progressing. You're making progress in this one zone, making progress in this other state. Like, you're constantly moving forward. You're constantly earning loot. Whereas you have these other activities, for instance, Strikes and Crucible, that basically force you to play them and nothing else. Yeah. And I and I feel, I think this is the biggest problem, this whole segmentation of Destiny. I think this is the biggest problem for PvP players. If yeah. you love Crucible and if you play Destiny for Crucible, you are fucked. Mm-hmm. Because, like, if you want some of the best, uh, if you want some of the best weapons in the game, if you want more different varying armor to actually customize your guardian and make them look the way you want them to look you have to do a bunch of shit you don't even want to do Mm -hmm. there is no way to earn for example uh planetary materials on doing crucible matches why why not when you uh defeat a win or or lose on a crucible match depending on the map you get materials from the the planet that that map is on right like there's so many things bungie could do so that you're constantly making progress in multiple avenues of the game and not just, okay, I'm going to play this version of Destiny 2 and the rest of the game I'm just, like, not going to touch because I can't touch because I want to play Crucible. Mm. And, again, that's just, mm. Look, I understand having certain activities with exclusive rewards. That's a good thing. You want, you want to have a ride in the game. You want to try and incentivize players to do other stuff so that they're not bored with the game. Multiple activities, multiple uh, multiple ways to play the game, lots of replay value, uh, incentivization to keep coming back and playing more. Like, I get all of that. But at the same time, as much as I enjoy Destiny 2, it wastes a lot of your time. Mm-hmm. It wastes a lot of your time forcing you to do things you may not even want to do. Mm-hmm. And that's all because of the fragmentation of the different game modes. Yeah, it's... It's very easy to see when you start to actually play it because you're if if I go to strikes and I complete some stuff in there, uh, I then have to shift gears and go into crucible, complete some stuff there. Uh, But then I go, well, crap, I still need to get uh, all this ethereal spiral from uh, the tangled shore for spider and I need to waste another hour or so on a track path, just picking up the stuff that I might need from there. Uh, I feel like the philosophy and tonal idea, like, let me go back in in time here for a second for Vanilla Destiny 2, for instance, to point out this uh, whole thing. What they were trying to do with Destiny 2 originally was include this idea of we want to take out every aspect uh, that gets you back to uh, shooting things on the ground, basically. So they basically added in capability for you to just select what destination you want to get to in a hurry, uh, flip out through this. They included the the bounties and activities, if you will, when you got to the zone. They just had them as tasks. And that was the old bounties. Uh, and after you were done with those, you got your three tasks done, it was over. 
in a lot of rights, the planetary bounty system hasn't really changed at all since Destiny 2, uh, outside of the fact that you have to go to the vendor in order to select it. Uh, what is slightly different, though, with now how the philosophy all seems to go is it's not about how quick you can get something done or how much those uh, general activities overlap. It's now about how much time can Bungie effectively make you waste in game, which I think kind of goes back to your point entirely. Uh, I don't feel that they're respective of the time that I end up putting into the title. I mean, that should be point in case enough when I end up looking at uh, the Bright Dust bounties and they only give me 10 for, uh, per completion. That's a joke in and of itself. Uh, this is where... A lot of the live service model titles, I think, really, I, we see it with Assassin's Creed originally, where they had really bad EXP gains and everything. Oh, yes. Uh, everything of that same notion is there to make sure that you continue to play the game over and over and over. Uh, there's also a huge debate that's going on right now in the Destiny community about FOMO or fear of missing out because of how activities are sort of placed into the game and how they feel and uh, play and handle. Like, you can't go back and do Vex Offensive, for instance. You can't see the buildup of the uh, of the, the gate that Ikora was working on that no longer is there. Uh, in some cases, there's some neat aspects to that because it does feel like the world is sort of moving along as time goes by, but there's such small microcosms of everything that it just doesn't work or make total sense to me, at least. Uh, I have a feeling the same thing's going to happen with Saint-14 when this season's over besides. Like, all of it is, it's a question of how much does it all matter, and Bungie needs to be the one to emphasize that to me, but they don't do so. Not often, not, not nearly as much as they need to do. So, I don't know. Aye. And just before we touch on the season pass, one more thing. We've talked about activities and the, the multiple separate progression systems, but mm. it also feels like, like I said earlier, the games within games with Destiny yeah. 2. And I think there's no better example of, uh, of that than the recent Moon uh, play space. Like, right. I, I enjoy the Moon. I really like the Moon. But it's immensely irritating that it has its own separate progression system that's nothing like the rest of the game. Mm-hmm. Like you have the phantasmal fragments, you uh, <laughs> you have the whole thing about the uh, the nightmare hunts and trying to build a uh, dreambane armor and the uh, particular moon weapons. Like it's its own separate progression progression system that once again separates you from the rest of the game and everything else. Like if you want to earn moon loot, you just have to play on the moon nonstop. Right. Whereas, and, like, I play on the other worlds, I'm earning planetary materials, I can spend those at Banshee and, and get the upgrade modules and, like, upgrade my favorite gear. Like it, it fe- like, it feeds into one another. Like, even if I'm playing Strikes or Crucible, like, I'm still, in a sense, feeding Banshee, in a sense, like, because I'm getting gunsmith materials and stuff like that. Like, th- they feed into one another. Whereas with the moon... I have to get the the helium uh, helium fragments, right? Or is it called helium fragments, yeah. or is that the different filaments, fragment yeah. filaments? Thank you. There's so excuse me for screwing up terminology, but there's a lot to remember in this game. Okay, I'm sorry. Well, well speaking of that, I wanted to say they were synths from Drifter. They are, um, but that that gets to a, a whole different thing. I'll bring up here soon enough. But go ahead. I. So, again, while I enjoy all the new play spaces and activities Bungie adds to Destiny 2, it's still frustrating nonetheless that I have to just dedicate myself to this whole other game within a game. Mm-hmm. And it, like, uh, no, it's, don't get me wrong, Destiny 2 is not the only game that suffers this. Warframe no. is a prime example. Warframe also has a very similar problem with Destiny 2 with fragmentation and having all these separate games within the game, multiple progression systems. And, uh, unfortunately, like, again, these games, like, as much as I love Warframe, as much as I love Destiny 2, and I enjoy these games, they have solid gameplay, and they do have really fun activities, despite the fragmentation of these activities. Stuff like the Menagerie, oh, God, I love the Menagerie. Stuff like that, like, I love, I love these activities, and I do enjoy the loot I earn from them, but it's nonetheless a massive irritation, like, again, let, let's, let's be honest here, this isn't the end of the world by any means, first world problems, but nonetheless, mm-hmm. it, these feel like problems that could be easily avoided by just, like, opening the loot pool, 
like not restricting resources to just these areas, having multiple bounties that assist each other and add, add on to each other, like you said with uh, that bounty master from the first Destiny, mm -hmm. uh, first Destiny game. Like, again, there's so many options Bungie has to just, like, not waste so much of our time, and yet they don't utilize them, and that's a, that's a bit disappointing compared to other battle passes. And uh, to add on to that, what we've been kind of building up to, like, the new seasons Destiny has introduced. Well, they're not entirely new. We've had se we've been going for the annual pass and the seasons and whatnot, uh, but now they've really made these much larger, much larger all-encompassing events and limited time with the addition of the season pass or mm -hmm. their version of the battle pass. Now, I love Destiny's version of the battle pass. It's very rewarding, and again, it does what I wanted Destiny 2 to do and tie everything together. You're always earning XP no matter the activity you're playing, so you're always earning loot from the battle pass. That is excellent. That is excellent, and I wish, like, there were more progression systems in the game that did what the battle pass was doing in tying everything together. But then we have the limited time seasonal events and activities. And you guys know how I feel about time gating and limited time content. You know how I feel about that shit, but I'll let Beard Grizzly take it away from here. Yeah, because nothing says let's just make something that doesn't really stick with the game and doesn't have to stay with the game, so we're not going to try it like limited time events. Uh, this is not to say that the environments that Bungie crafts are not amazing because they are but it is to say plenty about the activities that we have seen so far in terms of the vex offensive and then also with the sundial both of these events have in my opinion been very lackluster overall and they know for a fact that they don't need to worry about them much because well the arguments can go out the window because objectively they're going out the window as well here very soon so what does it matter to complain about them? Well, that's the issue. You continue to create a set of events that effectively are there for a limited period of time, and I don't really get the chance to go back to them ever again. That kind of sucks. You're also giving the same general treatment to uh, that with Ada 1 and the Forges because you don't allow us to select them anymore. You also kind of take away relevance uh, for instance, the old uh, bounties that you could get from Callus in the uh, Tribute Hall would give EXP. They no longer do. Uh, you could get EXP from, excuse me, you could get EXP from Ada as well off of the bounties that she had as well uh, previously. You no longer can. Uh, relevancy has been something that Bungie is keeping to themselves in a lot of rights. Uh, and it's something that I feel like they're either just afraid to open up all the stop gaps and just allow people to play how they want to but it really feels wrong there's no reason that those limitations should be placed on things within the season pass as a whole but beyond that the events themselves uh, tend to be something that also are a little off for the story which again is something that i focus on within destiny fairly well uh the story and lore that Bungie has crafted has been something that they've tried to play with a little bit more as like an open time thing in a way. Uh, things and events have happened. You still see them and progress through them. You can still revisit all of these items as like set pieces in time. That's the whole reason that you replay strikes the way that you do, and maybe you get some different dialogue out of them, sure, but they're all meant as set pieces in time that you are replaying over certain periods and whatever you kind of feel like it. The seasons, however, if we're talking about fragmentation, especially from a story standpoint, all feel very fragmented. Let's go with uh, Shadowkeep as a, a, from the get-go here. Shadowkeep introduced the pyramid ships. As soon as you saw the pyramid ship, you're just like, holy crap, they're closer than we think. This is going to get really bad really quickly. And then Season of the Undying's moments end up really kicking in. You have the Vex that are resurrecting, they're coming out of the Black Garden, and then the ultimate goal is to take out the Undying Mind. While some of the overlay from Shadowkeep's campaign is still showing you bits and pieces of why you need to still care about the 
uh, nightmares and everything else that are going on with the pyramid. And Season of Dawn starts after you end up killing off the Undying Mind so many times. But the pyramid's still there. We rarely hear about it. We don't see its effects past the nightmares in lost sectors outside of uh, the ones that we find on the moon or elements that we see on the moon. There are, a, I can think of one artifact's edge uh, on Nessus. They have the uh, nightmares there that are inside of that lost sector. Uh, that and several others, there are a couple cases of it, but we don't see that influence expanding at all. So why are the seasons, as they are meant to be, this evolving world idea, not evolving the world? They're more like time stops over everything. And that's even what I kind of experienced uh, last year with Forsaken uh, and how they were handling the Curse of the Dreaming City. The same thing was kind of going on there because seasons left as this time stop for everything else that was going on, even though you went back to do those activities a little bit now and again. Uh, the whole point of Season of the Forge was the Black Armory, finding the forges, creating those weapons, figuring out what was going on with them, digging into the history of the Black Armory. But there was no additional time frame that happened with the other events that were going on outside of the Black Armory. So that's where it feels very disconnected in that regard. Uh, for instance, and I like to kind of go back to these as uh, fair examples, Destiny 1 had a couple of stories that existed that were larger framings, of course, and they still exist now at Destiny 2. Uh, the Vex are a big one. The Vex showcase this example and this idea of time and how they can maneuver through it and everything. We're seeing that expand with uh, right now with Season of the Dawn, in fact, uh, with Curse of Osiris. But they were never a center focal piece outside of vanilla Destiny 1. It felt like they still didn't really have an idea of what they wanted to do with them. So they left them kind of on the back burner. But there were these little hints and pieces that they played with uh throughout the Taken King and throughout some of the other elements of Destiny 1's uh, lifespan. One mission uh, that they introduced in Taken King that also linked to another very important uh, exotic weapon that we got back in the day was called Paradox. Paradox's whole bit, if I can go a little lore heavy here and bear with me for a second, because even, even if you take out this character was very important through it all and this is why, you can still get the general sense of, I think, what this is all talking about, why I'm tying it back this way. Pradith is a character that we hear in this mission, in Paradox. And the whole idea with Pradith is that he is locked in prison by the Vex, in time prison. He's able to get messages out to uh, some people occasionally when the Vex end up having this weird hole that pops open for his prison. Uh, he can't escape through it, but he can at least send some kind of transmission out to it. It's not the only time that we have had uh, some kind of conversation with him. It's not the only time that we've known about Praetith previously. We knew about him from some of the lore that was presented to us or the grimoire cards uh, when those were built up and given to us. But the whole point of Paradox was to show that the Vex were just as worried on the uh, the taking from Oryx as we were, because they were just as affected overall as anybody else. But that was one of the only missions that we really saw the Vex being uh, completely tied in with it. But what did that do for world building? Well, it gave us a new character to really think about in Praetith, uh, or at least to remind ourselves about Praetith. It also gave us a new weapon called the No Time to Explain. It also ended up giving us uh, different versions that could be completed as the heroic version or the standard version of that mission would be. Uh, and it also gave us the idea that the Vex and the Taking uh, were not something that were, uh, uh, well, what's the best way to put it? They're, they're very much a part and the Vex still have to worry about it and understand about it. Uh, so the whole taken process is something that the Vex had to still explore as well. Uh, that was something that just did a bit of world building, and it made sense. Taken King also had another piece behind that as well with uh, Petra and Varix. 
one of the expansions for Destiny 1 was called House of Wolves. The whole point was for you to work with Varix, uh, the Awoken, and Petra in particular uh, to track down the House of Wolves to put a stop to them and make sure that they were not a problem for the Awoken, uh, for the Wreath, for us, and that they couldn't end up utilizing Vex tech to their uh, advantage to change the timelines, which, funny enough, we're kind of doing right now with Season of Dawn. But anyway, in Taken, a King, uh, Taken King, they introduced a mission where you work with Petra and Varix to stop the last bits of the House of Wolves. That was another tie-in mission to what we had previously. Here's where Destiny 2 really flops in that respect, because there are no tie-in missions like that. Uh, I cannot think of anything that largely presents itself as like a showcase of what else is going on around the universe outside of like some written lore to really keep you engaged that way. And I would say the one exception, the Outbreak Perfected quest. Well, Outbreak Perfected still didn't really work with a lot of uh, story tales, though, because it introduced a new... Uh, fallen house to us like it really didn't do a whole ton uh i would say that it, it was it, it did bring back that mifrax character from the uh the that adventure we did on uh oh no, no adventure quest we did on titan which he's actually been inside of the lore a little bit and i appreciate that they brought him back but that was like one of the only pieces of that that actually either one made sense or two wasn't new for what we had previously uh, I, I I thought I would mention it though because the, there has been small attempts. Yeah, small. Uh, what that should show is that they still have that general sentiment in mind, and the question is why are they not doing it anymore? Because if I were to look at anything that we have from Forsaken and onward, when was the last time you dealt with the Scorn in Destiny Two? Forsaken. Mm-hmm. They didn't bring them back in any other right. Why not? There's still a problem in the system. There's still an issue that we have to deal with. They're not just derivative to the Tangled Shore. They are outside of just that area. We should be worried about them. We're still worried about Fickrel. We're still worried about the fact that even if Fickrel is not dead or is dead, the Scorn still have the capability to bring back the old Scorn in some way because of the ether experiments that they can do and the ether rituals that they have. So Bungie has these things tied into and is writing them into the game, but isn't taking advantage of them. So the question is, in that respect, why? The other one that I will tie into before I get to my last point on uh, where I think this is all kind of going to is, again, the pyramid ship. As I mentioned before, it's there. It's active. We have to worry about it. But we're not. You're not tying Shadow Keep back into Season of Dawn. You're making it a completely separate activity and not bringing it back to what needs to go on with the moon and the whole premise that you're in right now, which is Shadow Keep. There was more buildup and attention given to the pyramid ships in all of Forsaken's lead up than there has been now. Why? What changed in that narrative, and why exactly is it that you don't want to touch base on it? I'm going to go out on a limb and say, you're afraid. You don't necessarily want to continue to run on those story gaps, and you want to not tie everything together properly, because you are afraid that you might screw something up again, like you kind of did with Taken King, and how you basically made Rise of Iron feel a little on the miffed and lowered uh, important side as well. You're afraid to do that again. And I, as a creator, can understand that. But what I'm not so okay with is when people in the community can give you ideas, have given you ideas, and you don't think to run with them. It's obvious you sit and you listen. It is obvious you sit and take in criticism. It is obvious that you go ahead and try to get some of these levels out there. But as far as how you're building the world, I continuously have to question why every new season is a time stop. For the story progression of things, it doesn't work. For the evolving world level of things, and especially with FOMO, it doesn't work, except for a business sense. 
And I don't think that that is all that you care about at all. But it is a showing and problematic side that needs to be spoken on a lot more. I, 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 like, Bungie keeps talking about an evolving world, and there's so many things they could do to make it feel that way. For instance, with Shadowkeep, why were nightmares so limited? Why didn't we start seeing nightmares in the Black Armory activities, in the Menagerie, in Gambit, in the yep. Dreaming City? Well, like, Actually, there are no nightmares. Like, in every other Lost Sector, you'll encounter nightmares, but not the Lost Sectors in the Dreaming City. Why are there no nightmares in the Dreaming City? Well, and to add to that, all that the nightmares tend to be are some slightly updated models with the different, like, the nightmare aura effect that they have, uh... And that's all that they really gave them. So it wouldn't be difficult to implement them. No, it shouldn't be. That's the the whole joke behind it as well. Uh, They could have done something. uh, Here is also where I have a mild problem as well because of the uh, implementation of like the prime evils and everything in Gambit. Mm -hmm. Uh, Instead of having a system like that. Uh, you could also have the nightmares pop up in there and suddenly Drifter go, well, how did that get in there? You know, that that same kind of thing could happen in that regard. Uh, If they are supposedly working underneath the same general principles as like what the pyramid ships have, which is, excuse me, the the darkness in a lot of rites or whatever the force is that the dark is, so on, uh, then why couldn't you tie that in? Doesn't make any sense. I, like I said, there's so much that Bungie could do to not just, like, for the sake of gameplay and progression, but story-wise. There's yep. so much they could do to tie everything together and make it feel more fluid and seamless and cohesive. Mm-hmm. But they they, they, they they don't do that. They don't do that. Like, I kind of understand wh- where they're coming from, from a certain designer perspective. You want to keep people engaged. You want to keep, ooh, look at this new shiny thing. Look at this new shiny thing. You want to keep people engaged. And I, I understand also wanting to build up the world. Right. By doing this whole fragmented, here's an island. Here's an island of story and gameplay, that a new island of story and gameplay that you can explore. And once you're done with that island, you can move to this island. I, I, I understand that kind of design philosophy to keep people hooked and playing. But at the same time, you're also, ugh, like, it's great for new players. But for veterans, again, veterans, and, and the Warframe community is going through a similar thing. Mm-hmm. Where, yes... Uh, digital extremes. They keep adding all these new gameplay mechanics and modes and features and all this new stuff to Warframe. And for the casual player, for the new player, this is great. Because you got these mountains of content and, like, once you're you're finished with uh, this part of Warframe, you can move on to this next part and it's like you're playing a whole other game. That, I, again, for the new players, that's great. But for the people who've already invested a ton of time in Destiny and a ton of time in Warframe and and they want, like, an experience that, like, doesn't waste their time, well, well, you're shit out of luck. Like, I, I, like, I want to earn this weapon. I want to earn this piece of armor, but I don't want to do that. Like, I can understand, like, forcing people to do certain activities, but the fact that there, there's no workarounds, there's no leniency, and the fact that we have this supposed grand overarching plot that just, like, constantly, like, here's a new chapter, we're going to go to this completely other side of the world, no, that has nothing to do with everything you just experienced. Oh, oh okay. Uh, when they could well, easily tie things together with Callus, with the Drifter, with Osiris, with uh, even with Anna and uh, and Rasputin. Like, these could all easily tie in together, and they did a lot of that in Forsaken. Do you remember in Forsaken in the uh, early months where, we, uh, where there was actually unique dialogue on how... Um, Petra was speaking to the previous characters we we uh, met in the expansions and how yep. she was looking to them for solutions. That was a great little tie-in right there. That was a great little tie-in like and they reminded you, "Oh yeah, there's a bigger world outside of just the dreaming city and me doing all these activities here." Yeah, they uh, I I should stress this too because I probably upset at least if Bungie ever decides to listen to this uh somebody that's over there, but it's the direction that things have been taken. I don't think it's necessarily like the writers or the, um, uh, well, I should say the story developers, as far as like what we see in game, I've got a partial problem with, but the guys that write the lore with the, uh, written word on weapons and grimoire cards or whatever you want to call them right now, it's still fantastic in my opinion. 
uh, the lore for Destiny has still just been knocked out of the park every single chance they can get. Uh, problem is, is that it doesn't feel like that same general care and attention is taken into the game itself to have those connective tissues that really exist. So I think overall that's one of the things that they, they can improve on very much uh, while the lore is given off that ability to do so. And they have less fear that they can basically drive into that because, oh, it's written word, and we can also edit that out if we need to. They can see that full storyboarding that's there. But as we're finding out with things like, oh, I don't know, the new Star Wars trilogy, for instance, you have to map things out ahead of time. You can't just say, this is the season and this is what it's going to be. And for some cases that I've seen throughout all of this stuff for the the uh, whole of what Forsaken's uh, content in season pass was, that's exactly what it wasn't. It was showcased as this idea to not build off of a, a world that's there, which in my opinion, is one of the biggest failings you could ever do with a game like Destiny and not incorporate the entirety of the system or you, uh, world that you are building when the universe is such a focal point of it. Uh, you basically just have, again, these time stops that make it so this season is only worried about this, this season's only worried about this, but there is no connective tissue that binds it back towards the base of the game that you bought, which would, in that case from last year, be Forsaken. So, I know I'm kind of treading the same ground in some cases, but it's just to really hammer down the point. Uh, this fragmentation is by their own doing, Aye. and it is something they could easily go ahead and think, well, all we have to do is plan a little bit more and think about content drops throughout the, the full entirety of the year. And I get that things change, I get that things alter, I get that you might have to go ahead and bring out some kind of release to say, well, we were intending to do this, but we couldn't do it because of time, so this is going to be ha uh, the thing that we have to uh, kind of come to that middle ground on, we're sorry. Uh, that's exactly what the grimoire cards and lore entries are. They're the stories and tales that you couldn't get to, but you're... One of my biggest complaints with Season of the Drifter, for instance, the lore... And the invitations of the nine basically were overlapped entirely. And there are some cool pieces behind that because you get to see the events that happen, but there's nothing new added to it because you unlock the lore so early on within the game. And the season is pretty well borked for the rest of the time period, thanks to that reasoning. Uh, also, these releases for like weapons and everything that they've been doing, if we if we kind of want to uh, on a on a story basis, I have this as well. You can experience the story of this game a lot easier than what you're presenting with seasons. The idea of clipping them out as far as you have been doing and like setting, well, we'll give them half an hour here, half an hour there, half an hour there. It's still the same amount of time. You're just not letting me fully go ahead and grab onto it how I would like to. And that choice is something that you're taking away. That's why you have a community right now that is in the arguments about FOMO, fear of missing out, again, as heavy as it is. It's a problem that you need to think about for seasons going forward. I also, though, understand you can't change your path that you're on right now. Because you probably are trying to think ahead, and you are trying to map things out, but you're still not connecting the dots. Whatever you think you're connecting the dots with is so limited and loose and very safe played that there's nothing here that really builds that universe. That's a problem. I, and to, to, to set a positive example here, Something to take reference from. A game both Beard Grizzly and I have uh, praised, like, every chance we get f for, like, just how well it handles the live service model, how well it handles its progression system, how well it, like, handles itself in terms of not being fragmented and being a very cohesive experience where everything ties into, uh, into each other, uh, especially with the addition of its latest expansion. Yes, we're talking about Monster Hunter World. I don't think a lot needs to really be said for Monster Hunter to be quite drank. Uh, I, I've been a fan of that series for a very long time. Uh, in a lot of cases, uh, Capcom has actually done a better job with content releases for that game, even DLC, 
uh, back when it was on the PSP. Uh, they had a system where they actually would allow you to download some like variants to hunts that existed previous, uh, or they actually added all new hunts all together for the PSP free of charge. That system hasn't really changed for them at all. And no, I don't count Iceborne as DLC. I count that as a straight new game. That they use that engine, that they built off of that, and use the same system, and then basically said, well, we're just going to take a new story, a new everything, and build on top of what we have. That's basically what the ultimate versions, or the X versions, and so on, uh, or G-Rank versions, were all about with Monster Hunter previously on DS and PSP. That's exactly what they were. So it makes total sense for them to have done that here with Iceborne as well. Uh, but yeah, everything ties together, uh, even if they uh, have like a, a Witcher uh, crossover event, for instance, <laughs> yeah. or they have a <laughs> Devil May Cry crossover event. Uh, they explain it in a real cheeky way. Uh, you're still doing you. You can actually still do all of your bounty tracks and everything that you grab from the uh, the provisions masters and everything like all of that just ties together into what you're trying to do for the hunt that you're building. Uh, that's the kind of example, even if it is limited in scope compared to what Destiny has for uh, the amount of activities that uh, Monster Hunter has versus Destiny uh, that they should be going for. They should try to have that cohesive piece behind it uh, in everything that they do. And this is not to say that they should not have specific things that are tied to those activities. There should be strike-specific loot and bounties. They should probably be more weekly than they should be anything else, though. Uh, there should be ones for Crucible. There should be ones for Gambit. There should be ones for the Forge. There should be ones for anything. And to get into those activities, maybe like over the course of each day uh, or like once or twice over the course of the week. Yeah, maybe that makes sense, especially if Destiny is one of the only games you play, for instance. But if it's not, just be respective of the time that we have, Bungie, that we're putting into it. You uh, we, we keep railing on this whole idea of well our true fans will be here for us i'm sorry your true fans are anybody that plays your game anybody that wants to sit and support anybody that for me wants to go ahead and listen to a video that i have overall if they're going to give me criticism if they're going to go ahead and uh tell me what they loved about it or if they're going to go ahead and tell me you know my my mom's fat or something one way or another they gave me kind of some kind of support they gave me traffic they gave me something and overall, there are some things that you don't have to listen to, like your mom's fat. But overall, <laughs> I can still go ahead and listen to the criticism and those that liked what I had. Uh, and even if they're only there for two or three videos and they're like, hey, I thought I liked your content. I guess not. And I'm out. Uh, then the question is, what didn't you like about it? What do I need to change? But in the same, Destiny has also gone through, and I think Bungie has too, so many changes the scope of the game constantly alters and uh, shifts and changes. And there's to this point where I don't even know what game it is anymore. I can alter my play style. I can alter whatever it is that I'm doing uh, near about as any time that they may go ahead and put in an expansion and so on. But for those that are not full, like hardcore, say the casuals, for instance, Say there's another shift here after they've gone free to play. Say they institute something that says, well, we're going to go fixed roles with some things again. Uh, we're also going to change how you progress in this system and so on. You can only do that so many times before you, one, burn people out. And two, you have such drastic changes in systems that people are like, I don't even know what kind of game this is anymore. Uh you alienate people. I think that's the word I'm kind of going for here. But with time, with all of the changes and alterations that you continue to make and the things that don't connect together, you alienate people heavily. So be mindful of that every time you go to make a change. That's why I haven't really changed things like uh, uh, the art on my channel, for instance, or the thumbnail style that I have, even though I think I should. Uh, 
all of these things are synonymous to who I am, and my writing style hasn't changed or altered either because I think that all of those are synonymous to who I am. And I think that that is one thing that as a company and especially as a game, you need to realize the identity of what Destiny is and say this is what it is. Is it a power fantasy or is it going to be something that you go ahead and disable a couple of exotics because all of a sudden they're overpowered for a little while when we had One-Eyed Mask and Lord of Wolves reign supreme for six, year, six months to a year? You tell me what kind of game you want to craft because right now I'm confused. I, I... So if I were to offer a few personal suggestions to Bungie to help improve the cohesion of the game, one of my first suggestions would be just more bounties. More bounties, period. Every vendor. More bounties that tie into one another, that encourage you to play other activities. Like, again, like, have us constantly earning progress everywhere. Instead of having us just constantly traveling between these different islands, bring them together. Bring them together. Make this a continent. Make this a giant freaking landmass. Don't make... I, I, I really think they need to backpedal on this whole island mentality. Yeah. Br bring well. it all together. Bring it all together. Have all the activities tie in together. Have it be part so that we feel like we are part of this big open galaxy that... Like, yeah, we're a part of this. Because it feels like we're a part of all these other different worlds that are completely separate to, from one another. Right. It doesn't make any sense that what I do on the moon has zero effect on what I do on the Dreaming City or on Earth, that there's nothing there. The only thing tying everything together right now is the Battle Pass, mm -hmm. but and but that's it. You could do that's so much more. That's such a loose connection. That is I... such a loose connection. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. To add on to your point a little bit more, uh, I would honestly say just make every single vendor look like the Drifter's Inventory. That's exactly what all of them should be like. Uh, there should be reasons to go back to vendors for things other than just like a couple of boosters uh, or to reacquire a couple of very repeatable quests that are ridiculously overpriced in Glimmer for a couple of Bright Dust, I should add in. Uh, all of these things are necessary to be like re-looked into when it comes down to the game, I think. Um and you would think with, like, the basis of this title and everything and everything that we just got done talking about, you would think we hate it. Uh, and I still go back to it, I think, every single day at this point, even just to uh, complete the, the Banshee stuff that he has. One, because I need enhancement cores, but two, just at least to give myself an excuse to play for a little while. Because uh, I still, I'm so enthralled with this universe, it's not even funny. And I know people that are in the same general vicinity uh, that even quit when uh, Destiny 1 was basically uh, stopped as the main project and they just didn't want to carry over to Destiny 2 at all. But they're still so invested in the universe of what Bungie has crafted here. That's why I want to see these things. That's why my criticism is so heavy handed in a lot of rights, because I want to see the game continue to flourish because I know what kind of potential it has. It's the same general idea as what I thought would have gone on with something like freaking Warhammer or Star Wars Extended Universe. Any of those. All of these pieces could be worked in and made to build this like really cohesive, functional world and universe that they have. And I just really feel like, again, I'm going to say this, really feel like they're afraid to do that. I don't know why. I, I... It, it kind of comes down to this. Bungie, we want to spend time in your universe. So you want to spend time in this game, in this world you've created. So please stop wasting our time so we can enjoy spending time in it. Yeah. Be, be respectful of it. Because I know that, yeah, we're, we're yammering on here and we're probably going upwards of an hour fully here. <laughs> uh, in, in a lot of rights, that's not necessarily respecting everybody else's time because we are rambly shits. But when all <laughs> is said and done, I... I really do think that there are reasons for why we get so rambly, and it's because there are so many things that we see that you could work on that just need slight improvements, slight tuning, slight changes, a different view and direction. These things are not things that are, I think, complicated. They are things that uh, kind of infuriate me because they are so simple that they could be worked on a little bit more or the direction could shift a little bit and all of a sudden everything could be fixed. 
And some of this stuff I will also say is subjective. It's not objective in its overall idea. But one thing that is absolutely objective for any of it is that everything should it, it, like our takes and everything and like what direction they could go or anything that's subjective. The objective idea is simply this. Everything should link in one fashion or another. Couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you, all of you, so much for tuning in and listening. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please remember to follow and subscribe and support my good friend Beard Grizzly here. Much better content creator than I. I mean, maybe you're not wrong, but we'll see when I get that Doom video up. Oh! <laughs> can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> Thank you. If you want to help out and support this video, please remember to like, leave a comment, share it on social media, and again, follow and support Gr uh, Beard Grizzly. Links in the description and in the comments section. Any thank you guys uh, closing again for having me here again, Ryan. Thank you again for for allowing me on. Uh, if you guys have anything that I can help you with in Destiny or otherwise, of course we got the Discord and everything that I've got running. Uh, if you're curious about anything with Destiny, if you really still have not tried out new light or anything for pc ps4 or xbox uh, i will still tell you to do so even after all of this i will tell you to still do so uh i know plenty of people with new light that are still having a ton of big fun right now so uh, again small changes that can really make a big difference it is all devils in the details as the old saying goes so again brian thank you for having me on uh to everybody of uh Ryan's viewership and everything too. Thank you guys for listening to me as well. This always great to be here. Oh, you're melting my heart. <laughs>